going to um, explain a little bit more, and then we'll hear from Laura. Thank you, everybody. There's also seats up in the front for folks who are standing in the back, although sometimes I love to stand, so I get that. Um, this welcome to a monthly meeting of the Collaborative on Health and the Environment. This is the Washington chapter, and we are, this is a business meeting, of the Children's Environmental Health Working Group of CHEWA, the Collaborative on Health and the Environment. We're an ad hoc group. We're people who come together on a monthly basis because we have an interest in reducing toxic exposures to children. Different people who come monthly offer to host a meeting and to find a speaker. We've had many, many wonderful speakers on different topics. If you're interested in this group, you can find us online at chewa.org, C-H-E-W-A.org. So today, uh, we've had an offer to have the presentation focus on crumb rubber, and the hosting agency will provide a welcome to you. And so I think I'll turn it over to you, Laura, now so you can say who you are and how it is that you came to do this. There you go. Welcome, and thank you all for coming today to learn more about crumb rubber and health. Um, I'm Laura Johnson, and like many parents, I had assumed that the fields that our children played on were relatively safe. Four years ago, when I first stepped on a crumb rubber field, I remember it had an odor, particularly on hot days, but I thought, when I found out it was recycled, I thought, okay, I can put up with the smell. Later, when I heard of concerns, I really did not know what to think. So I decided to look for answers. I learned that in the late 1990s, with a mounting scrap tire problem, it was decided that grinding up coal tires into tiny dust producing bits and spreading them on athletic fields, or shredding tires into chunks and placing them on children's play fields, was a solution to a stockpile of environmental waste, as well as a cushioning agent on the ship. By the early 2000s, with an abundant supply of a very cheap product from rubber cities in Japan. And currently we have about 12,000 fields nationwide. Each field contains between 20 and 40,000 recycled tires that after eight to 10 years will still need to be disposed of. But now, instead of a full tire, we have millions of tiny bits. I was surprised to learn that since it's recycled, it is unregulated, so nobody is overseeing safety. I found out that those with a financial interest in its use lobbied the CPSC to exclude artificial turf from being classified as a children's product. Therefore, the turf and its components are exempt from laws on chemical of chemicals of high concern for children. In June, a Yale study determined <coughs> that the tire mixture contains as many as 96 different chemicals, 12 carcinogens, 20 irritants and that almost half of the chemicals identified have never had any toxicity assessments, so we really don't know anything about their effects on health. 30 to 40 percent of a tire is composed of carbon black, another suspected carcinogen, and newer tires can, can contain carbon nanotubes, which some scientists suspect may act similar to asbestos when inhaled into the lungs. Tire manu tires are manufactured to provide best performance for cars and trucks by using a multitude of ever-changing chemicals designed to enhance driving. They are not designed with children's health in mind. Tire industry and tire recyclers have safety sheets, advising of the hazardous chemicals and warning against skin contact, eye contact, and breathing of vapors. When applying crumb rubber to the field, workers are advised to wear respirators to protect from inhaling the dust. However, unlike, unlike regulated industry, there are no requirements to inform field users about the chemical contents and risks or precautionary guidelines for protection from these chemicals. Currently, Norway, Sweden, Montgomery County, Maryland, New York City Parks and Rec, and LA School District all have bans or other limitations on the use of crumb rubber. And other communities are considering similar actions and Senator Marilyn Chase is introducing legislation in Washington State. Proponents of crumb rubber state that many studies have proven safety. They will acknowledge the toxins and carcinogens 
but they claim that they are locked inside of the chrome and that there is no scientific evidence of harm. Therefore, they are safe. However, lack of proof of harm is not proof of safety. There are many gaps in the studies and much of the testing has focused on heavy metals. Creative industry marketing teams have been able to spin these limited studies in such a way that consumers do not realize what is missing. We are the victims of misleading marketing by industry and the lack of safety oversight by government. All of us, parents, school districts, parks and rec, and of course the children we are supposed to protect. To date, there have been no long-term studies looking at the cumulative effects of all of these chemicals on the human body, particularly on children. Children especially deserve prevention-based policies, which insist on long-term independent studies before they are exposed to a chemical or product, not after. Parents are starting to speak up and demand answers, but right now no one can provide them. It is clear that the government does not have the answers. Recently, CPSC chairman stated, safe to play on means something to parents that I don't think we intended to convey and I don't think we should have conveyed. On Monday, an EPA spokesperson summed it all up when she said, current studies are inadequate and new science is needed to answer questions about turf safety. And existing studies do not comprehensively address the recently raised concerns about children's health risks from exposures to tire crumbs. So new studies are being developed, but science takes time. In the interim, we are advocating for requiring that non-toxic alternatives be used on all new fields, and that users of current crumb rubber fields are advised of precautions to take to reduce exposure, like covering water bottles, not bringing equipment into the car or home, and showering right away. However, none of these precautions will protect from the risks associated with inhalation, which is why my son no longer plays his favorite sport, lacrosse. However, I hope to, <coughs> I hope to change that. Through this experience, we have been reminded not to simply rely on, in, on safety claims provided by industry. We need to look to the <coughs> experts concerned with health, not industry-hired experts, but experts in children's environmental health, like Dr. Gilbert and Dr. Anderson, who have graciously donated their time and expertise to speak with us today. Most importantly, we need to educate <coughs> other parents on the, on the risks. And that is why a group of local parents formed the Washington Alliance for Non-Toxic Play and Athletic Kids. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Stephen Gilbert, director and founder of the Institute of Neurotoxicology and Neurological Disorders, author of A Small Dose of Toxicology, and a diplomat on the American Board of Toxicology. And Dr. Anderson, who has a PhD in toxicology from the University of Washington, where his research was on the combined toxicity of multiple toxins in nuclear power plant effluent. He is currently the director of EnviroStress, which specializes in the effects of mold and mold remediation. Please hold all questions until both doctors have presented. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Senator Chase asked me, when Senator Chase asked me to find out what was going on when they decided to put uh, crumb rubber on the uh, fields in Edmonds, she asked me to look at some documents that were being presented to the Edmonds City Council. I had no idea what I was getting into. I haven't worked with <laughs> crumb rubber before. I'm just reviewing somebody else's report, and it took me quite a while to figure out what was going on or wasn't going on, what information wasn't being presented. So. What I'm giving you today is what I've found in the last uh, couple of months of looking at the literature.
taking temperature measurements on the fields. I uh, went out to uh, various fields locally and said, okay, what's going on? What things are really making sense? Uh, and, and what isn't being said? So what I'm going to be showing you is my outline, essentially a mind map of what I think has been going on. What is it? Uh, why is it composed the way it is? And essentially we've got fiber and then we've got padding. Uh, the fiber is basically the grass, the green stuff. The padding is the chrome rubber. And the only reason that's there is so that if you fall on it, basically you don't get hurt much. There are other replacements other than the options they chose, <coughs> but essentially that's what's there. So if we look at the MSDS, just by what's going on, the MSDS says that the root of, of exposure to the stuff that's in chrome rubber is inhalation. Um, my thoughts were, went back to Love Canal. Love Canal, you could drink the water, you could uh, eat the dirt, you didn't really get sick, but if you took a shower in water and you inhaled it, basically what was happening is then that became the root of exposure that was the critical one. So I'm looking at what's the exposure here, what's going on with um, uh, people who are exposed on the field, how is their exposure, and what makes this different than anywhere else. As was brought up before, there are no standards. It's inconsistent. There is no way you can compare what was done here to somewhere else because you don't know what's in the stuff that's in, on your field. So therefore, you really can't apply broad, broad uh, analysis of what's going on from the chemicals in one to another because you just don't know. <coughs> They're all different. So I took temperatures on uh, the field locally on an 83 deg degree day. On the grass, it was 87 degrees in the grass. On the field, uh, in front of the uh, uh, soccer goal, it's 144 degrees. Then I looked at some studies that were done about different kinds of turf, and they found in California that you get various temperatures with different kinds of, of things. So what they did find was that on the turf in California, in the afternoon, the temperature may be 90 degrees in the air, but it's 171 degrees on the field. So the field temperature is 171. So I said, okay, there are complaints. We've got people who have cancers. We've got different situations. Can these things all interact in such a way so that it might cause something? Is there uh, a smoking gun here? And essentially what I did is I said, okay, I've got to go back to basics because I really don't have good data on what's there, the chemicals or what the root of exposure is. So I said, data is being collected and done in labs. The labs are all done at STP, standard temperature and pressure, 25 degrees, room temperature. The kids are exposed at 171. And I measured 144. If you look at the temperature coefficient, or Q10, it says that in biology or physiology, what we're, what's going on essentially doubles the rate of what's going on at one temperature compared to another temperature, it's called a Q10, essentially doubles at every 10 degrees centigrade. So what happens if you're at 171 degrees compared to the test results at 25? Well, the ratio of those two results is 40. <coughs> so what's going on on the field is essentially 40 times more than you would see in a lab. So there's more going on in the field than what you would measure in the lab. So that makes sense. Something else is going on. If you look, if you look at the field and you say, who are the people that are having exposures? The few people who are having exposures are in one place at one time. Things are being broken down in one place. If you look at a grass field, you'll find that that's the one place where there's no grass. So there's something else going on, a mechanical exposure. And also there's more going on because the athletes aren't just playing a game. They're training all week long. Then they spend one hour playing a game. But the training time is very significant. And what do goalies do when they're, when they're playing? They're diving to block a ball. So they're spending a lot of time in the turf. When you look at the chemical composition of the um, uh, crumb rubber, I'm not looking at the turf. Uh, but just the crumb rubber. Yale did studies. It found many different things were in it. Essentially what it, it did is it's an independent analysis, a brand new crumb rubber. This is not age. They <coughs> found essentially 10% or 10 of those, 20% of the chemicals they found were uh, potential probable carcinogens and um, I think it's 19 or 40% were irritants. So there's really something there that has a, has a potential. 
if you look at standard toxicology, what does this all mean? Toxicology normally uses one chemical at a time. You do a test on an organism and then you do a, a factor to figure out whether how that applies to a human being. But it's done one at a time. But the exposures are real world exposures with multiple toxins. So my work was on multiple tox toxins from effluents of nuclear power plants. They used a, a, what we call a toxic unit approach. So if you get one toxin out of a certain concentration, another one at another concentration. It doesn't make any sense to add the parts per million together. But if you say that this is half of what it takes to kill 50% an LC50, and the other one you're getting half of what it takes to kill the LC50, you can add those two together, half and half would equal one. So if what you see in the field is more than that, then you have a synergistic effect. If it's less than that, then you don't have, then you, it's rather, antagonistic effect. So we have to consider uh, those. I, I don't want to interrupt. Hello. Um, I, I think I just, uh, I don't know if there's some technical difficulties. We're only seeing the welcome screen still. And I'm thinking there's a, this Arthur? a share my screen thing that's going to happen. Yeah, let me just address that. This is, I have it here. It's all right. It's not going to be that much. I'm sorry. Folks who are uh, distance participants, that's correct. There is no slide or slides that you are seeing. There is one slide that the speaker is working off, which is basically notes, which is also, I think, hard to read. Can you guys read it in the back? Yeah, yeah. see, even the people in the room can't read it, so don't, don't feel lost. And the other speaker will not be using a PowerPoint. So this is why you're only seeing the welcome screen. Does that answer your question? Oh, okay, great, Thanks. Okay. Anything that we do uh, have later, we'll put up on the website. So my concern was, if you look at uh, a combined effects approach, you have to use something other than adding chemicals. You have to use, uh, what we used was a, a, a toxic unit approach, which essentially says you've got to do something to figure out whether or not there's an additive, a synergistic, or antagonistic effect. So there's more to it than just looking at concentrations. What are some of the possible effects that could be happening? And again, Amy Griffin, the University of Washington soccer coach, is the one who is now keeping track of these, this information. And from her perspective, she's finding out there seems to be something that is special about goalies. And my comments were, could this make sense? And what I found was, okay, it can make sense because of the physical things the goalies are doing during practice. And if you look, there may be some increased surface area just from breaking down the uh, um, mechanical abrasion of the, of the crumb rubber. And just by calculating uh, calculations, that could increase things, expose the increased surface area by about 20 times. So if we've got a more evaporative surface that things can get can come from, uh, and we've got a higher temperature, then it's real that there could be something going on in the fields so that is something you don't necessarily find in the lab. So recent studies uh, in environmental health perspectives looks at phthalates and exposure to phthalates. Uh, one of the things that's found in some chrome rubber. What they found was if you looked at phthalates in the air and actually in clothing, that you would actually find those phthalates in the urine of the, of the participants on the study. The only reason I'm saying that is if you take the crumb rubber home with you and you put it in the dryer and it's on your clothes, you may actually getting it, be getting an exposure that's occurring after you're off the field. So we don't have data to show that it's coming from crumb rubber, but there is data to show that this is exactly what happens in phthalates. So there may be more of an exposure than just being on the field, and it may actually stay with you because it's in your clothing or in the uh, crumb rubber that you take home with you. So, what do we do now? Is this important? Can we figure it out? When I started looking at that, where there's a publication in carcinogenesis this year, uh, it was published in January, uh, and the finalized, final publication uh, was in June. Essentially, they're looking at uh, car assessing carcinogenic potential of do to low dose exposures to chemical mixtures in the environment. Now we're looking not at toxicity, we're looking at can you cause a cancer? And they're saying in, in this supplement, this is an area of major need to study because you really can't 
go from toxicity to cancer based on the kinds of exposures we're talking about. So research, or scientists are saying, doctors are saying, this is an area of need. We don't have all the answers here. And it's not one group, it's across the world that we're saying that the same thing in preventing the disease. And I can put the citations in later, uh, but basically what we're doing is saying that this is, what we're seeing in the field is real. There are major research needs to be able to document this and the concerns from major, um, from scientists in several different disciplines are saying this is an environmental area that needs to be uh, addressed. So in, in summary, what I'm saying is, it's likely there's something going on, I can't tell what's going on, but the mixtures are very important to consider and cancer is not directly a, a, a result of toxins. So diseases and cancers have to be combined with the effects of toxicology, but we don't have the tools to answer all those questions right now. And in, in, in summary, the health effects of chrome rubber research is really already underway. The athletes are on the field. They're doing the studies because they're there, they're breathing, and they're being exposed to it. Remember, dose in a toxicological perspective is milligrams per kilogram of body weight. So a 50-pound child compared to a 200-pound adult is going to get four times, four times uh, 50 to get, he's going to get four times the dose of an adult because he's got one-fourth the weight of the adult. So children are going to get a higher dose just because of their weight when they're on the field. So who's keeping track of this? I don't think anybody is. I'm not aware of any studies that are keeping track of it. And nobody's keeping track of, of the disease rates. So really, is it only Amy who's keeping track of this? I, I think it is. More research needs to be done, and I think this is one of the areas that, that needs to be done, is keeping track of what's going on on the field, what's actually in the field, and what exposures and what diseases, not just toxicity, is going on associated with individuals in the field. David, were you going to mention your cup there? Oh. <laughs> well, th this is a visual you can't quite see. When we presented this before the uh, um, Edmond City Council, we had a, a glass of wine, or a glass, a wine glass with cork in the top of the wine bottles, and then I actually had a friend of mine make a wine glass or goblet out of recycled tires. So we have a wine goblet, and my comment to the individuals who are saying that there's really nothing going on associated with recycled tires, which glass would you drink your wine out of? <laughs> the wine glass that was exposed to cork, or that with his uh, crumb rubber? I did not do a PowerPoint presentation today. <coughs> with the uh, issues here, I did start a PowerPoint presentation. I had something going, but then I looked at, you know, what do we need a PowerPoint presentation for when we have common sense? You know, <laughs> and I, I look at these issues, and this this is a classic repeat of so many stories we've heard before. Well, cigarette smoking. Well, you know, it really doesn't cause cancer, lung cancer. We can't prove that it does, and we just are off on that. And this is just one of these classic things where, again, have our kids out in the field being the test subjects. And this should have been studied years ago before we started. Does anybody really think putting styrene butadiene rubber on a field is a good idea? I mean, just from that get-go, it just does not ring true. 
But there's a lot of people, again, making a lot of money off of this stuff. It's a great way to get rid of tires. That was a big problem. It's much better spray on fields, I guess, having them burn. But, you know, maybe not. You know, so I, I didn't do a lot of work. I did some work on this stuff. And I think one of the really good papers is a paper by uh, Nancy Simcox, Synthetic Turf Field Investigation in Connecticut. And they did a good job of sort of figuring out what chemicals might be in the rubber. So we want a paper that looks at that. That's a pretty good paper to look at. They did both examine the rubber and also they did some uh, sampling studies of people out in the field. So I take a look at that paper. So that's by Nancy Simcox. And she's actually, she was a Connecticut, well, she did this work. She's now at the University of Washington. And it's Synthetic Turf Field Investigation in Connecticut. There's a couple papers in this series. And the gradient did a great study, one of the consulting firms, but I did not read through that paper. And I'll tell you why. The first thing he did a slight review of toxicology, sort of introduction to toxicological principles. And he said right in the beginning, the dose is the actual amount of chemical that enters the body. And right from the get-go, it's exposure is the amount of chemical. And as David said, you really have to look at body weight to get dose. And kids are a lot smaller, kids are not little adults, they eat more, breathe more, drink more than adults do, so they get more exposure right away. They have a higher dose because of smaller body size. So I did not read through grain of these, I just stumbled over this simple, very important fact about the difference between dose and exposure, and I just could not get myself to read the rest of the report. But I haven't gone through that in detail. So, I mean, the literature is huge, but it's the same thing, both good and bad stuff. It's industry building up uncertainty around the issues. They haven't bothered to study the issues carefully, and they should have done this before. We do not, we should have been manufacturing a special product to be in the field we're exposing this many people in fields. And just a couple things, Dave mentioned briefly about nanotubes, nanoparticles, in the composition of tires always changing. So it's another big problem. Potential for nanotubes is a real, you know, nanoparticles is an important issue. Laura mentioned that they tend to be sort of similar to asbestos, the sharp edges, so they might be cause lung cancers. And they have to look at the small size and the rubber broken down the particle size below PM 2.5, 2.5 microns, you have to worry about inhalation, moves in down into the deep into the lung. So, you know, again, not a good idea. And I just want to quote one person I have a lot of respect for is Dr. Phil Landerman. He's done a lot of work on child health related issues. He said, children go to playground almost daily. He used to dean by the way of Global Health, Mount Sinai Hospital. And he says, any gifted athletes are on the soccer field almost every day. That sort of cumulative exposure results in a build up their body of these toxic chemicals that can result in a build up of cellular damage that caused by these chemicals. They can result in diseases years or decades later. And again, that's one of the problems is you're not going to see this cancer or other toxic effects occur immediately. There's going to be potentially years down the road. You're not going to have a very difficult time linking it back to exposure to the field. It'll be interesting to see how those studies that Amy is tracking, that's head of the coach at the University of Washington, whether the cancer can be related back, to whether it's a goalie or not, and things like that. But those things are always difficult. So Landry's final thing is little children should not be put in a situation where they're forced to be in intimate contact with carcinogenic chemicals. To me, that's just common sense. You know, we need to protect our children. I got into this issue a little bit, probably because my granddaughters. They're out there in the fields playing this stuff, and I first looked at what is this stuff? You know, when you find out it's crumb rubber, and you know rubber is made up of a whole host of different kinds of chemicals, you got to think, this is just not a good idea. And the studies are difficult to do because, as they mentioned, you've got variability of temperature, you've got variability of age of the fields, different kinds of rubbers across the fields, you know, what rubber the compound are in there. So you just, you're starting from a deficit there. But my view, the real issue, the industry should have studied this very carefully, and the government should have forced them into doing that before they put this on 12,000 fields and chop the rubber. So I'm going to leave it there, and I'm really happy to answer questions. Maybe I take questions or Laura. There's some really knowledgeable people here, more knowledgeable than myself. We also start a website called Facts on Crumb Rubber, a new website that Laura's helping us build up. So it's going to be, I really want to try to make it as nonpartisan possible. It says Facts on Crumb Rubber. So you can come in there and take a look at studies, news reports, things like that. Related to Crumb Rubber, but it's back What are what are the alternatives to Crumb Rubber? 
And how much more expensive are they? There's a number of alternatives. Um, so there's Nike Grind. Which we don't know a lot about. Um, appears to be less toxic than crumb rubber, but we really don't know. Then there's a number of organic products that contain a mixture of <coughs> husk, uh, cork, and there's a few other geophil products as well. Um, and we're working on getting all of that information together so that we can present it. Zeolite. Zeolite is made from? Zeolite. <laughs> okay. Zeophil is made from <coughs> zeolite. And then there's also different plastics. Yeah, the organic. Yeah, there's well, there's different plastics. plastics. Um, Can't hear. There's, there's also a thermoplastic elastomer, which is a food grade plastic. Um, it doesn't produce the dust. It maintains the integrity through the life um, lifetime. You can reuse it on the new field, so it's very recyclable. Um, various price ranges on these products, and one thing to keep in mind when you're looking at it is to look at the lifespan. Um, if you use crumb rubber, it's cheaper to start with, but you still have to dispose of it, so there's a cost for that. If you use some of the other products, you either reuse it on the new field or it's compostable, and so there's you don't have that cost involved. <coughs> uh, just I, yeah, just to comment on that, I think that's a really important issue that there's sort of <coughs> side issues, the ecological issues of this stuff. You know, how is this stuff moving around the environment? It's being washed into the stream bed, to the getting out of the fields, the grass fields. Would you really spread crumb rubber on your lawn? And I'm going to take off some crumb rubber and start. No, probably not. So, but that's an issue. Where is it going? Who's ingesting it from an ecological standpoint, as well as our kids, of course. You know, with the chrome rubber, you do have an ecological problem with the zinc getting into the streams. There's also a heat effect with the chrome rubber that you wouldn't have with the organic infills. So there's a whole host of other problems that you don't have. There's also grass is an alternative <laughs> that hasn't been talked about as much. Um, the, you know, with the all artificial turf, you have um, a carbon footprint that's huge. Um, it's been estimated that for it to take out grass and put it in um, an artificial turf field to offset the carbon footprint, you would have to plant 3,000 trees um, and grow them for, you know, 20 years or whatever. Um, so, that's another consideration that has not been fully explored. Christy, for just can you introduce who you are and <laughs> people know who's speaking? Um, Christy Davis, PhD, um, and I'm with WENPATH, Thank you. which is Washington Alliance for Not Toxic Play and Athletic Fields. So today was health related. There are a number of environmental aspects on this, but we decided to stick with the health related portion of it. On the alternatives, um, I know several field. I know several school districts have gone to Nike Grind, um, but I'm wondering if you know of districts that have gone to the more the organic fill South in, in Washington. South Kitsap recently put in one using a plant-based material, <coughs> and from what I've heard so far, they're very happy with their field. Okay. Um, I have documentation of at least 15 other fields going in over the summer using an organic plant-based plant material. Here in Washington? No, across the country. Oh, okay. Because I've heard, I mean, the concerns that I've heard is that the performance in our wet weather with some of the organic stuff doesn't work. And I'm just wondering if there's, if you've got right. evidence that so they are working, or they do we work. Do you have indication that they work well? So there was a, a variety of plant-based materials, and some failed early on. So if you want to spin it, that they won't work. You're going to spin it and look right. at those early ones and say, look, they didn't work. Um, if you look at the whole picture and see what, what is working <coughs> now, you can look at Bowen Island, you can look at South Kitsap. Um, it's used widely <coughs> over Italy. So there's, it's used in Texas, which is hot and humid. Right. So there's, there's indications that it works very well. Right. Italy's rainfall is equivalent to the rainfall in the western Washington. Right. 
stuff. And the, it doesn't heat up like crumb rubber right. does. No, I so know that. although yeah. the synthetic field will be warmer than grass, it won't be nearly what the crumb rubber field will be. Right. Right. And I think that information, the more you can get out about the alternatives, is important because I'm a soccer mom. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've been involved in the soccer um, community for a very long time. And people aren't going to want to give up their turf fields, but they do not want the crumb rubber, and they are concerned. So if there are alternatives like that, mm -hmm. to me, it's going to work better for them. Good to know. May I ask a question from the from out here? Yes, identify yourself. Oh, okay, sorry, this is Stephanie Lacoven. Okay. And um, I'm wondering, other than the most sustainable, the, the more sustainable options that were mentioned, is is all artificial turf crumb rubber? I'm thinking of arena sports and places that are indoors and what some of their options might be. Ninety percent of synthetic turf fields are crumb rubber. Okay. So most likely. Yeah, I've I've communicated with Arena Sports when when some studies were first coming out, and um, and they were you know they sent me there, they emailed me all their literature about why uh, artificial turf is safe, and obviously I took it with a grain of salt, but um, I just wasn't sure if some of the outdoor options or some of the outdoor options also available for indoor. It could be either way. Yeah, crumb rubber is also used on indoor sports fields. So okay, thanks. So, any other questions on the phone? And then I see two or three hands up. Okay, um, so go ahead, Laura. Uh, let me pose three questions. One is uh, uh, State Representative Jerry Paulette uh, uh, at a soccer dad. <laughs> I'm a goalie. Yeah. Um, so, um, one is uh, for Dr. Anderson. I've been looking at the toxicological studies. Um, you said that they were not done at elevated temperatures, and is that a rather universal statement? Because much of the studies out there say there's not much shown in the way of other than zinc. Um, releases, so just want to check on that. Well, I started out with uh, trying to understand what was going on, because obviously they're people who have cancers. So could that be a real possibility? Is it just an association? It's not caused by, but associated with? So when I, what I did is I went back to the basics, and I said, okay, how do reactions occur? What do we do in science? How is that applied to the real world? And, and does it make sense? When I did that, then I said, okay, let's do some basic math. You have to do research where you can compare your results to everybody else. So it's called standard temperature and pressure. Got to do it that way. Otherwise, you can't, care, can't compare your results to somebody else's. But that doesn't mean you can compare those results to what's actually happening on the field. That's where the, the, the link is broken. And my way to help calculate whether that's a big deal or not is to compare the rates of reaction of what would go on at a standard temperature versus the temperature the kids are actually in. So I was very surprised when I came back with a number like 40. That's, I, I expected maybe double, but no, 40 times? That's, that's just a very, uh, that, that was very surprising. Then when I looked at the mechanical breakdown of the, of the stuff so that your goalie is standing in one place and it's actually breaking down the dust, I'm just assuming that if you take the same, um, it, it, essentially if you break it down, you get a lot more surface area. And my calculation was it could be as high as 20 times. So 20 times 40. So we're getting big numbers here. So what I'm saying is, if you just use lab results, it doesn't apply to what's going on in the field. What's going on in the field is much worse, <coughs> or the reactivity is much higher than what you're measuring in the lab. So when a, a, a toxicologist or somebody says, does it bother you? That's right, at 25 degrees. But maybe at 171 degrees Fahrenheit on a field, maybe it does bother you. So the other two questions, thank you. I really appreciate that understanding that. Um, 
And the other two questions are, I read in one of the articles about uh, Amy Griffin that the State Department of Health was beginning to collect data. Do we know anything about that? And thirdly, um, has anyone begun any studies looking at blood levels of phthalates in soccer, you know, <coughs> some cohort versus soccer players? I looked at studies on phthalates, and I and I was very surprised at what I saw. What they're finding in lab studies of people who were going into a chamber where they're actually being exposed to phthalates for a period like six hours. So it's a it's a it's a real world exposure. And one of the things I was very surprised to find out is if you actually look at the phthalates in their clothing, meaning they just put the clothing there, and it was exposed all night, and then you put the clothing on, and then went into that same space that didn't have any other phthalates, so it was just coming from your clothing, that when they measured the phthalates in your urine, just from the clothing, it was like being exposed in the air for like six hours. So this is a, stu a recent study, and it's in environmental health perspective. It's, it's, well, it was done correctly, so it's useful information. So it says to me that what you're taking home with you, and again, it's not just phthalates, is probably continuing exposure beyond the time you're on the field. And that's the kind of study that needs to be gone, done more thoroughly, because when you talk to parents, drum rubber's everywhere. Oh, yeah. And all throughout your clothing dryer. And the car. Nancy, I don't want to put you on the spot, but do you know if Department of Health is uh, tracking? The Department of Health has a website on synthetic turf that includes an analysis by one of our toxicologists. Um, a list, um, you can go from that website to a second page that lists a lot of research. And it does talk at the end of the website about the cancer cluster investigation that Department of Health is engaged in. And additionally, on phthalates, we do have a local expert toxicologist pediatrician at the um, Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Unit, Sheila Sathya Ariana who is a national expert on phthalate exposure in children. I don't know that I've ever heard her talk about crumb rubber because there are so many other phthalate um, exposures. I mean, we're all right now being exposed to phthalates because there's fragrances in the air. Um, so, but Sheila would be the one I would talk to about phthalate exposure in children. Hi, this is Holly Amazon. Can I mention something? Yes. What's your organization, uh, Holly? So Kathy Wasserman at Department of Health is working on the epidemiology of um, exposure to crumb rubber. She's the one doing the cancer cluster investigation. Yes. She's our non-communicable disease epidemiologist. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you. Um, I wanted to add something to represent help um, with Dr. Anderson's answer. There was one study that looked at and lose phthalates um, in football players um, after they've been on the field for two hours. And it looked at the, I believe it was the phthalates in their urine. That's the, and they did not see a significant rise in phthalate level in their urine after they'd been on the field for two hours. Um, but there's been nothing looking at goal, there's been no human exposure data on goalies, nothing <coughs> looking at the blood, nothing on children. That's it for human studies, looking at the health effects or biological markers for exposure in human beings. So basically, yeah, we're left with Amy Griffin's list. <coughs> Um, are there any, is there any research just uh, just with like air testing, like at a place like Arena Sports or even just on a summer day at on, on field? Is anyone doing a personal air monitoring on the players? Well, California Environmental Health Group is going to be working on that, you know, the state OPEA group. And you look at Nancy Simonic's paper, they did some inhalation studies for individual breathing space. And they try to look at uh, the turf because it was just there. You got to remember, there's two different turf. There's the crumb rubber, and there's also the turf. And the turf also had a lot of lead into it at one time. They try to remove some of that, but lead is not also an issue that's an uh, ongoing problem with this stuff. 
So it's 11.30, we have time for maybe one more quick question, and then I'd invite the speakers to stay afterwards if people have individual questions and want to talk. I thought that one of you mentioned that some of this come over is new product. So if that's the case, and some people are thinking it's recycled and it's guessing it's green, but it's actually created for this purpose, is some of it, is it all from previously used rubber? My understanding is from definition, chrome rubber is made from recycled tires. Okay. It, it wouldn't quite make sense. I mean, the, the reason they're using it is it's, Cheap yeah, that's what because I'm it's an environmental waste product. Yeah. So I think when you're hearing new crumb rubber, they're meaning just prepared to go on the field as opposed to crumb rubber that's been on the field and has been exposed okay. to wear and tear, environment, etc. So. I was the one who said that, and, and the reason why I said that is because if you take crumb rubber and <coughs> take it out of the bag, meaning it's just going to go on the field, and then you compare the stuff that you have on the field that's been out there for seven years, yeah more stuff comes out of crumb rubber or is released on the, on the aged crumb rubber than on the new. So if you try to compare new stuff just ground up and then stuff that's been on the field for seven years, it, it's a different stuff, it's a different substance, different things are coming out, more is leached out of it, more things are coming from it. So again, I'm trying to just let you know that what's going on in the field may be worse than just the brand.